Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here and a great privilege to debate David. I think the central question that we're facing, and, and this was brought out very well by Jeremy's introduction, is not so much the question of what should we do, but what can we do? I served as a diplomat in the Balkans and in Indonesia working on East Timor, and I am very, very much convinced that the intervention in Bosnia was a good thing. And any number of Bosnians will say to you that if you saw 37,000 Bosnians killed in the streets of Sarajevo, it's not that you objected to the Americans attacking the Bosnian Serb artillery positions, you would want to know why did they not do it sooner. There are contexts, there are occasions in the world where intervention is morally necessary, strategically necessary, and something of which we can be proud. The problem, of course, of the last 20 years is that we have reduced this insight to the absurd. Our success in Bosnia, our failure in Rwanda, and our success in Kosovo, and our failure in Somalia, put us into a situation in 2001 when we felt we were godlike. We felt we could do almost anything. And I felt this myself as a British diplomat, as somebody who'd been very briefly in the army, been in the Balkans, I felt that in Afghanistan and Iraq, we had an astonishing opportunity to transform these societies. I still believe that there's nothing wrong with the moral instinct. I'm not committed in the most theoretical level of international law to state sovereignty. It's not that I believe that the fact that Iraq was an independent country gave Saddam total immunity. In fact, I believe if you can intervene in a country, prevent a genocide, and improve dramatically the lives of the people within that country, you would have a moral right and something close to a moral obligation to do that. But the question is not what should we do, but what can we do? And the awful lesson of the last decade is that we don't know very much about these countries. We can't do very much in these countries, and we are not very welcome in a lot of these countries. Particularly, for example, in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, we're intervening in countries which are, brutally, a long way away, where we lack the history, the linguistic expertise, the cultural sensitivity to really begin to understand the textures of those societies or states we find ourselves floundering and failing. And most desperately, we find ourselves in a situation in which opposition groups, whether it's the Sadrists in Iraq or the Taliban in Afghanistan, are able to present themselves as fighting for their nation and for Islam against a foreign military occupation. They're able to portray these involvements as neo-colonial, there are certain things we could do to improve this, and maybe as the debate continues, we can talk about some of those things. We could, for example, improve the quality of our foreign offices. We could get out of our embassies more. We could speak other people's languages better. We could try to think about whether there are certain elements in Bosnia and Kosovo which we can identify, which would mean that success was more likely there than in countries like Iraq or Afghanistan. But the basic message must be one of prudence, not of selfishness, not of saying this is none of our business, but of saying, do no harm, of identifying that other people's countries, other people's nations are intrinsically unpredictable, chaotic, uncertain, and understanding ourselves, understanding our own tendency to exaggerate our fears, to make a country like Afghanistan seem the source of all global terror, to believe that unless we do something in Afghanistan, bombs will be going off in Stansted. Unless we do something in Afghanistan, Pakistan will fall and mad mullahs will get their hands on nuclear weapons. 
recognizing our paranoia, recognizing our megalomania, the optimism of the American military, the British military, the optimism of our own cultures, which make us feel that we're godlike, that we can do whatever we want anywhere in the world. Recognizing our extraordinary smug sense of moral obligation, which combined with that paranoia and megalomania, drives us into places where angels fear to tread. So, what does this mean? It means that when David stands up, you will hear a very passionate, very charming, very well-informed plea for the moral obligation for intervention. And the one thing I would ask of you, while respecting his moral energy and direction, is to remember the necessity for prudence. Right? Necessity to ask not what should we do, but to remember we have been nearly 10 years in Afghanistan and we have failed entirely to create the economic development, the governance or the security of which we dreamed, despite the expenditure this year of 150 billion US dollars and 150,000 troops. And we are not likely to because we lack knowledge, we lack power and we lack legitimacy. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much, Rory. And now it's David's turn to give his first speech. Um, There is a certain asymmetry um, to this debate, not just in terms of your initial vote, but also in terms of, I think, the appeal of the people you see up on this platform. It's uh, indicative that... Rory Stewart's first book, The Places in Between, is a wonderful account of a 6,000-mile journey on foot across Pakistan, India, Iran, and Afghanistan. And my first book, Paddling to Jerusalem, is an account of kayaking up the Grand Union Canal. Um, His highlights are a series of meetings that he has with incredibly dangerous and exotic people. And my highlight is probably the moment that I nearly gave up the struggle at Tring after having to port 23 locks because I had bruised knees. Um, The Telegraph says about Rory, and and it's right, Britain doesn't make men like Rory Stewart anymore. Um, He was hailed by Esquire magazine as one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century. 75 is a slightly capricious figure, Rory, and I don't know where you came in it, but I think you deserved your place. And the information that Brad Pitt had already bought the rights to his biopic. I'm going to let you into a secret. Brad Pitt has not bought the rights to my biopic. (laughs) And when a... And when a U.S. magazine described Rory as it seems that he is the closest thing Britain has to a modern-day Lawrence of Arabia, uh, there are many things that I may be close to a modern-day version of, (laughs) but Lawrence of Arabia has never been one of them. Now, look, my understanding of the discussion about intervention really in very broad terms is this. In Chicago, in 1999, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, outlined an approach to replace the policy that itself had broadly, though it was never really outlined, replaced the earlier Cold War calculus, which had operated during the period that the Soviet Union and the West faced each other across the Iron Curtain. Uh, And essentially, what Blair said was this, and I would hold to it. Firstly, that the world is, in its globalized state, incredibly interdependent. There's something that happens in one place very likely has a big knock-on for the rest of us, and therefore the the notion that you could be hermetically sealed from it in terms of your interests were over. The second point he made is that in some situations, uh, Rwanda is the one which is most obviously given, but Sierra Leone would also be a case, we are, in addition to any calculation of interests, we may be morally bound 
to try and do something about a situation which is developing somewhere else in the world. You could make a case, for example, if one wanted to invoke it, that there was something to be done better than we did in the 30s with regard to Hitler's internal treatment of the Jews. You could make that case. The third element was that in general, in general, if the outcome in any particular country tilted towards democracy and liberty, then it will be better for us as well as for the people in that country, in general. And therefore, fourth, the kind of countervailing logic, the more it tilted towards dictatorship and to bondage, then the worse it was likely to be both for the peoples in that country and for us. And we can extend that a little bit. We know, for instance, that one of the greatest indicators of such things as population growth and poverty is the education of women. Uh, it is therefore significantly in our long-term interests that women throughout the world receive as good an education as we can manage to permit them and encourage them to have. The fifth element was that the old idea, the previous idea, which had been held in stasis during the Cold War, of not intervening in the affairs of sovereign states purely because they were sovereign and no matter what they did, was not conducive to the objectives that we had above. In other words, we could get some extremely bad long-term repercussions, quite apart from the moral questions, if there were genocides, massacres and denials of rights, or if democracies were effectively subverted or destroyed. The sixth point was the international institutions that we had, whilst being the ones that we had, were at that moment extremely imperfect for the purposes of bringing about these objectives. And one only has to think about the membership of Kerbikov Colonel Gaddafi of the, human, of the UN Human Rights Council and the other countries that are on that to understand the point that is being made. Seventh point is most intervention was not hard intervention, i.e. military intervention, it was soft. But where it was hard, then a number of conditions had to be made. First, were we sure of the case? Well, sureness is a tricky concept, but nevertheless, armed force is sometimes the only means of dealing with dictators, said Blair. Second, have we exhausted all diplomatic options? We should always give peace every chance, he said. Third, on the basis of a practical assessment of the situation, which is part of Rory's point, are there military operations we can sensibly and prudently undertake? Fourth, are we prepared for the long term? Having made a commitment, said Blair, we cannot simply walk away once the fight is over. This is slightly begging the question here, and we might return to it, about what Rory thinks should have been done in 2001, towards the end of 2001 in Afghanistan. I have to say that I am not at all sure myself, um, but I would like to hear what he has to say about it. Uh, and finally, do we have national interests involved? I've already suggested that national interest is quite a broad category, and we do in many ways. Now, um, I was going to go on, but I will go on in the second part of the speech, if the uh, circumstances allow me, to talk about the policy which that effectively replaced, although Rory has talked about it a little. Suffice it to say, not just in the cases of Bosnia or Rwanda or Kosovo and so on, but in the cases of Pakistan, in the cases of Afghanistan, and in particular in our long-term policy towards Iraq before we invaded all policies which were in the long term disastrous and led up to 9-11 and to other events subsequently, there were no chilcots. Because the truth is that disastrous foreign policies that involve inaction do not attract the same kind of opprobrium as difficult policies that have required action. Uh, I think that the circumstances described by Tony Blair in the Chicago speech of 1999, as we've seen in the last week, still pertain, and that the case for intelligent intervention still remains. <laughs>